Hi, I'm Mark Feldman, Senior Staff Engineer Manager with Qualcomm Technologies. In this tutorial, I will provide an overview of the typical scenarios and differences you will encounter when starting to develop with Vulkan. For even the most proficient OpenGL ES developer, learning Vulkan can be a bit intimidating, so you are not alone. Although there are many similarities with the two graphic APIs, there are also many important differences as we'll explore. There's a lot of new terminology as well, descriptors, WSI, pipelines. One of the key principles behind Vulkan is the ability to give you, the developer, explicit control of the graphics rendering. Sounds great, but more control means a bit more complexity. So with additional work, the reward is improved app performance. This video will cover a few of the high-level differences a moderately experienced OpenGL developer will encounter when starting to learn to program Vulkan. You'll find that you'll be able to leverage your knowledge of OpenGL ES rendering. OpenGL was ratified back in 1992 and has a long history of helping developers create useful applications over the years. However, its authors couldn't possibly anticipate the latest hardware features and graphic techniques we have today. As a result, OpenGL ES was spun off in 2003 as a subset to focus on the needs and limitations of embedded systems like mobile devices. For developers writing cross-platform applications that need to work on PCs, mobile devices, and consoles, this has been a difficult process. Partially because OpenGL ES was a subset of OpenGL, also vendor-specific extensions to the language to support new additions to the hardware have made supporting multiple classes of hardware even more complex. Vulkan simplifies this aspect of development, defining a single unified and modern API that spans all platforms. No more worrying about whether an OpenGL API call is supported in an OpenGL ES application. No need to spin off different versions of your app for mobile or desktop. No need to worry about designing radically different algorithms for mobile versus desktop hardware. EGL, as you know, is used in OpenGL ES programs to interface with the native platform windowing system. EGL handles context management, surface binding, and rendering synchronization. And EGL is used with OpenGL, OpenCL, and other Kronos APIs. In Vulkan, a set of API calls referred to as WSI will serve a similar purpose. WSI stands for Window System Integration. When using the Vulkan API header, you need to first define a preprocessor symbol for the platform you'll be running on. For example, you use VK Use Platform Android KHR for an Android build. You'll then be able to create an abstracted surface object. Similar to using EGL, you'll query the surface object for all its supported formats and select an appropriate one for the task at hand. You can also query the surface for properties involving the way results can be presented on it. Presentation of the surface on the device involves using a swap chain, a series of sequentially ordered images that are rendered to and given to the surface to present. OpenGL error checking is generally always in effect, slowing down a bit whether you are in development mode or running a shipping version of your app. Behind the scenes, the driver is always doing parameter validation, bounds, and format checking. You, the developer, use GL get error to figure out what went wrong and when. In Vulkan, error checking is optional. The Vulkan architecture is layered so you'll only load an optional validation and debug layer only when you need to, like during development and not in a shipping version. This layered architecture will allow for great innovation as device vendors and other third parties will be able to provide extensions and common tools which can plug into the common Vulkan framework. More tools at your disposal when you need them, an easy way to remove them when you don't. OpenGL ES is a state machine, a single monolithic set of states that control all aspects of the rendering process. You use the API to put the OpenGL driver into various modes which remain in effect until you change them. For example, current color, vertex and buffers array, viewport, depth ranges, rasterization, culling, multi-sampling and texture modes can all be set this way. GL enable and GL disable, or GL get, allow you to query and get the status of the state. In Vulkan, objects called pipelines are constructed that store all the state needed for the current rendering. The pipeline represents the processing path that vertices go through on their way to being rendered. 
Let's take a closer look at the Vulcan pipeline. Pipelines, also called pipeline state objects, are containers for all your information that are needed to render your geometry. There are two flavors of pipelines, graphics and compute. Pipelines define the stages, the vertex, fragment, tessellation, control, and valuation, and geometry, and the compiled shaders that will be used for the stages. Pipelines also contain information in smaller states about vertices and their input assembly into geometric primitives, the vertex declaration, the attribute information, strides between vertices, rasterization, culling, depth bias and clamping, line width and discarding, depth and stencil buffer operations, comparing operations and writing mass, color blending, the source and destination factors and mass for defining the color alpha blending, tessellation, how geometry can be subdivided, the viewport, the area on the render target to render to, multi-sampling, the number of samples to calculate at each pixel on the render target. You could also define the dynamic state which defines properties of the pipeline that are dynamic and can be changed independently. Viewports and scissors are examples of these. You'll also need to define the layout, the binding location of the descriptors, the resources used by the shaders in the pipeline. And you'll also need to specify the render paths that the pipeline will be used in. The environment that the pipeline will be used includes the input and output frame buffers, the depth buffers, and the dependencies between passes. Pipelines can also be derived from other pipelines, allowing for some optimization since we'll have a lot in common. Now once built or compiled, pipelines can be cached or serialized from one run to another, saving the time it takes to build one. This is similar in concept to OpenGL's pre-compiled shaders, but a lot more encompassing. In OpenGL, you issue a list of GL commands to do your rendering. There's no easy way to store these commands for reuse. With Vulkan, you use command buffers. You record the commands into a command buffer and subsequently submit it to a device queue for execution on the GPU. Command buffers can be reused and re-recorded. Recorded commands include those to bind pipelines and descriptor sets, those to modify the dynamic state, to draw, to execute other command buffers, and to copy buffers and images. A few items about command buffers worth calling out. First, they are allocated from command pools, which allocate the memory for the command buffer as it's being recorded. Second, recording command buffers has a big impact on performance. If you're creating command buffers during the rendering part of your app, you may want to consider using threads to build them. A good strategy would be to use one command pool per thread to avoid any locking. Third, there's primary and secondary command buffers. Only primary command buffers can be submitted to queues to be executed. Secondary queues are useful for storing a set of commands that won't change. Shaders access resources such as buffers and images. In OpenGL, you can call GL Get Uniform flavored calls to figure out where to set resources like textures that your shader will access. In Vulkan, these shader resources are known as descriptors. There are about a dozen of these resources that Vulkan supports. Sampler, sampler image, uniform buffer, and more. Your shader will access descriptors within a set. There are several Vulkan objects which are all related to involving descriptors. A descriptor layout describes the overall content of the descriptor set without specific reference to any of its actual resources. It's a blueprint for building the descriptor set. A descriptor set is a collection of bindings which map the actual descriptors to your shader. In your shader, you'll have a layout statement which connects a set and binding number to the actual shader variable. You'll allocate these sets from a descriptor pool. Finally, there's a pipeline layout, which is a sequence of descriptor layouts which describes the sets that are referenced by the shaders in a pipeline. Now, render pass refers to the process of doing multiple renders to the same series of similar sized frame buffers. A common example is post-processing of a frame where you apply effect after effect to the frame buffer. There's not really an equivalent to a render pass in OpenGL. Your application needed to manually implement the equivalent steps of attaching and detaching frame buffer objects and rendering at the right time. Render passes are a great benefit for tile-based GPU architectures like Qualcomm's Adreno because now processing for each tile can be done in order without writing out to system memory between each pass.
You need to define the attachments, the render targets, and describe how they'll be initialized. Then for each subpass, you will need to describe which attachments are used for input, which ones for drawing to, and which ones for used for as a depth buffer and resolving to. There are also dependencies which describe how the subpasses depend on each other. Render passes describe how the rendering should occur, but don't reference any specific render targets. Frame buffers are a specific set of render targets and views that are compatible with a render pass. You'll use both a render pass and a frame buffer when building a command buffer. There are commands to begin a render pass, transition to the next subpass, and to end a render pass. In OpenGL ES, applications have a rather limited control of memory. For the most part, allocating memory and client memory or using specific device memory objects like VBOs. In Vulkan, your application has the opportunity and is required to perform host memory allocations on behalf of the Vulkan implementation. This can be useful for debugging and logging memory allocation. You'll find many of the API calls have an allocation parameter, allowing you to hook in your own allocator. In Vulkan, memory comes in two categories, host memory and device memory. Memory is always visible to the device and can be local to the device as well. One notion is that memory allocated, which is called visible, can be mapped and written directly by your application. Your application can get information about the device memory, which is organized into heaps which have various types of memory in them. You may choose to have your application allocate large blocks and then handle sub-allocations for the various objects needed. A general pattern you'll find in Vulkan is to query objects for their memory requirements, allocate the memory, and then bind the application-owned memory to the objects. Multithreading allows applications to take advantage of the multi-cores available on hardware. In OpenGL ES, multithreading support was non-existent, though you could thread out non-graphics frame calculations like physics, frustum culling, animation. However, the rendering process was left to the graphics driver on a single thread. In Vulkan, you can still thread out the non-graphics frame calculations. However, more importantly, as we mentioned earlier, you'll use command buffers to define rendering steps to be executed on a single thread. These command buffers can be constructed in different threads in parallel and then be sent to the command queue, which can schedule and thread them. Similarly, building pipelines in parallel will allow for shaders to be compiled on multiple threads. Threading requires a bit of synchronization between command buffers. In addition, there's concurrency between the driver and the device and between queues. You didn't need to worry about this in OpenGL ES as the driver did most of the required synchronization work without you worrying about it. Now you do need to be conscious of synchronization activities. Vulkan has a number of synchronization primitives to help. There's fences, which are used to determine the completion of submissions made to queues. After submitting, you simply wait on the fence to become available and continue on. Semaphores, which are used to coordinate operations between queues, for example, to marshal ownership of shared data. Events, used to gauge progress through a sequence of commands. And barriers, which come in several flavors, a pipeline barrier, a memory barrier, and buffer barriers. In OpenGL ES, shaders are written using a language called GLSL. Vulkan uses a shading language called SPEAR, Standard Portable Intermediate Representation, which is a Cronus-defined standard. Technically, it's Sphere V, the latest version of the format. It's a language that's used in multiple APIs, including Vulkan and OpenCL. Having a single intermediate language to parse makes drivers much simpler and more reliable. Sphere V is a 32-bit work stream, easily parsed and extensible. There'll be converters from GLSL to Sphere V from Cronus, so no need to rewrite shaders. One more point about shaders is that the compilation of the shader happens at more predictable times than with OpenGL ES. So wrapping up this overview of Vulkan for OpenGL ES developers, you've seen that Vulkan is a new API that will require OpenGL ES developers to look at their rendering process a bit differently. We've touched on at a high level some areas that are quite different, but we know there's also a lot to cover and master before you'll be able to develop proficiently. In future videos, we'll dig into the steps and show you step-by-step -step how to create your own Vulkan programs. Please visit the Qualcomm Developer Network to learn more about graphics and tools on Qualcomm's mobile hardware.